Fire Alarm by Michael Lowey. This is part two of chapter one. Uh, thesis three. The chronicler who narrates events without distinguishing between major and minor ones acts in accord with the following truth. Nothing that has ever happened should be regarded as lost to history. Of course, only a redeemed man mankind is granted the fullness of its past, which is to say only for a redeemed mankind has its past become citable in all its moments. Each moment it is lived becomes a citation à l'ordre du jour, and that day is judgment day. There is a direct link between this thesis and the preceding one. It is a, a symmetrical and complementary inversion of it. The past awaits its redemption from us, and only a saved humanity can fully assume the past. Once again, remembrance is at the heart of the theological relation to the past, and of the very definition of Irlosang. Redemption requires the integral remembrance of the past, without distinguishing between major and minor events or individuals. So long as the sufferings of a single human being are forgotten, there can be no deliverance. It is doubtless a question here of what the preparatory notes, the so-called paralipomena, refer to as the universal history of the messianic world, of the world of integral actuality. The example of the chronicler to illustrate this demand may seem ill-chosen. Is he not the paradigmatic example of the person who writes history, history from the viewpoint of the winners? of the kings, princes, and emperors. But Benjamin seems to wish deliberately to ignore this aspect. He chooses, he chooses the chronicler because the chronicler represents the integral history he is calling for, a history that excludes no detail, no event, however insignificant and for which nothing is lost. The Russian writer Leskov, Franz Kafka, and Anna Segers are, in his view, modern figures of the chronicler understood in this way. Irving Wolfarth, one of the most insightful readers of Benjamin's work, rightly stresses that the chronicler anticipates the Last Judgment, which, like him, rejects any form of discrimination, a view that reminds us somewhat of the doctrine mentioned by Benjamin in his essay on Leskov of certain schools of thought within the Orthodox Church, which hold that all souls go to paradise. And Benjamin does indeed, in the Storyteller of 1936, mention Leskov's sympathy for Oregon's speculations regarding apocatastasis, the ultimate salvation of all souls without exception. The redemption, the last judgment of Thesis 3, is then in apocatastasis, in this sense, that every past victim, every attempt at emancipation, however humble and minor, will be rescued from oblivion and mentioned in dispatches. That is to say, recognized, honored, and remembered. But apocatastasis to stasis means also literally the return of all things to their original state. In the Gospels, the reestablishment of paradise by the Messiah. It is the idea of the wider bringung all or ding, return of all, all things, or the versenend rucker am endi der ding, reconciled return to the end of all things, Lotzi dreamed of in microcosmos. The secret or mysterious form by which, mo by which progress could incorporate the spirit of the ancestors. In other words, it is a question of the oh, Jesus Christ rest restitutio ad integrum or restitutio omnium Benjamin was already writing of in his theological political fragment of 1921. The Jewish, Messianic, and Kabbalistic equivalent of the Christian 
apocatistasis is, as Shalom argues in his article, Kabbalah, in the Encyclopedia Judaica. Tikkun, redemption as the return of all things to their primal state. Benjamin had been deeply impressed by this piece by Shalom, as he records in a letter of January 15th, 1933, to his friend. The rays of your article forced their way down into the abyss of my ignorance in this area. In the French translation of Thesis 3, made by Benjamin himself, he writes of l'humanité restituée, sauvée, rétablie. Three terms that relate to apocatastasis and ticken. From Oregon, through Gregory of Nyssa, John Scotus Eregina and the Anabaptists to Schleiermacher, the concept of apocatastasis has a dual significance. The restitutio of the past, at the same time, a novum. This is exactly what Shalom writes of the Jewish messianic tradition. It is animated It is animated both by the desire for the restoration of the original state of things and by a utopian vision of the future and a kind of mutual illumination. The utopian revolutionary dimension of apocatastasis is not explicitly present in Thesis 3, but it is suggested in a paragraph in the Arcade's project. Benjamin quotes a critique of the Surrealists by Emmanuel Burl. Instead of following the course of the modern world, Burl argues, the Surrealists tried to relocate themselves to a moment anterior, even to the development of Marxism. The period of the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, a clear reference to the utopian socialists and or Blanky. Now for the author of the Arcades Project, this refusal to follow the course of the modern world an expression that could only arouse contempt, is precisely one of the great virtues of surrealism, a movement inspired by the will of apocatastasis, the resolve to gather again in revolutionary action and in revolutionary thinking, precisely the elements of the too early and the too late, of the first beginning and the final decay. As remembrance of forgotten battles and the rescue of endeavors against the grain, the apocotestasis of the lost utopian moments of socialism is not a contemplative operation on the part of the surrealists. It is in the service of the revolutionary thought and practice of the present, here and now. Jetzt. There is no question for Benjamin of replacing Marx with utopian socialism. His many references to historical materialism show this sufficiently but it is a question of enriching revolutionary culture with all the aspects of the past that bear utopian hope within them. Marxism has no meaning if it is not also the heir to and executor of many centuries of emancipatory dreams and struggles. Thesis four, seek for food and clothing first, then shall the kingdom of God be granted to you. Uh, this is a quote from Hegel in 1807, just that sentence. Class struggle, which for a historian schooled in Marx is always in evidence, is a fight for the crude and material things without which no refined and spiritual things could exist. But these latter things which are present in class struggle are not present as a vision of spoils that fall to the victor. They are alive in this struggle as confidence, courage, humor, cunning, and fortitude and have effects that reach far back into the past. They constantly call into question every victory, past and present, of the rulers. As flowers turn towards the sun, what has been strives to turn, by dint of a secret heliotropism, towards that sun which is rising in the sky of history. The historical materialist must be aware of this most inconspicuous of all transformations. Let us begin with the Hegel text, an ironic inversion of the well-known passage 
in the Christian Gospels. It illustrates to perfection Benjamin's method of a quotation, which consists in despoiling the author of his text, the way a highwayman takes jewels from a rich traveler. The passage is literally wrenched from its context. Hegel, the great idealist philosopher, testifies to the most elementary materialism. At the same time, the epigraph connects thesis four to the two preceding theses. That is to say, it connects them to the theme of redemption, no salvation without revolutionary transformations of material life. The concept of the kingdom of God that appears here is somewhat reminiscent of that of Thomas Munzer, as Frederick Engels presents him in the peasant war in Germany. By the kingdom of God, Munzer meant a society without class differences, private property and a state authority independent of, and foreign to, the members of society. With the slight difference that Benjamin would not go so far as to fully, as so fully to secularize the theological significance of the concept. The historical materialism, the being schooled in Marx, that is referred to here is, of course, reinterpreted by Benjamin in his own terms. It is a heterodox, heretical, idiosyncratic, uncategoriz uncategorizable version. In certain respects, Benjamin is close here to Brecht. Like him, he insists on the priority of crude and material things. Food first, then morality, sing the characters in the Three Penny Opera. However, unlike his friend, Benjamin accords crucial importance to spiritual and moral forces in the class struggle. Faith, Benjamin's translation of the word zuversicht, courage, and perseverance. The list of spiritual qualities includes two others that are perfectly Brechtian humor, uh, Brechtian humor, and above all, the cunning of the oppressed. There is then in Benjamin a dialectic of the material and the spiritual and the class struggle that goes beyond the rather mechanistic model of infrastructure and superstructure. The stakes in the struggle are material, but the motivation of the social actors is spiritual. If it were not driven by certain moral qualities, the dominated class could not fight for its liberation. Let us try to pin down Benjamin's Marxism more precisely. The most essential concept of historical materialism for him is not abstract philosophical materialism. It is class struggle. It is that struggle that is constantly present to the historian schooled by the thought of Karl Marx. <clears throat> and it is that struggle too which enables us to understand the present, past, and future, as well as the secret bond between them. It is the place where theory and praxis coincide, and we know it is that coincidence which initially drew Benjamin to Marxism when he read Lucas's History in Class Consciousness in 1924. Though almost all Marxists make reference to the class struggle, few devote such passionate, intense, and exclusive attention to it as Walter Benjamin. What interests him in the past is not the development of the productive forces, the contradiction between the forces and relations of production, forms of property or state forms, or the development of modes of production, essential themes of Marx's work, but the life and death struggle between oppressors and oppressed, exploiters and exploited, dominators and dominated. History thus appears to him as a succession of, evic of victories by the powerful. The power of a ruling class is not the mere product of its economic and political force, or of the distribution of property, or of the transformations of the productive system. It always implies a historic triumph in the battle against the subordinate classes, against the evolutionary view of history as an accumulation of gains, as progress towards ever more freedom rationality, or civilization. He sees it from below, from the standpoint of the defeated, as a series of victories of the ruling classes. His formulation is quite clearly also distinct from Marx and Engels' famous statement in the Communist Manifesto, which stresses rather the victory of the revolutionary classes over the course of history, save in the exceptional case of the common ruin of the contending classes. 
However, each new battle on the part of the oppressed puts in question not only present domination, but also those past victories. The forces spirituel, or the, uh, never mind, that's French too. Benjamin's own translation into French of the current struggle, Rayonnant, shine forth into the distant past, into la nuit du temps, the mists, literally the night of time. The past is lit by the light of today's battles, by the sun rising in the firmament of history. The metaphor of the sun was a traditional image of the German labor movement. Brothers to Son to Freedom proclaimed the old anthem of the Social Democratic Party. But this was a reference to the sun of the future that illumines the present. Here it is thanks to the sun of the present that the meaning of the past is transformed for us. Thus, as in the example cited above, Thomas Munzer and the Peasant Wars of the 16th century are reinterpreted by Frederick Engels and later by Ernst Bloch in the light of the battles of the modern workers' movement. Current struggles cast into question the historical victories of the oppressors because they undermine the legitimacy of the power of the ruling class or classes, past and present. Benjamin is here explicitly taking a stand against a certain evolutionary conception of Marxism, already present in certain passages in Marx's writings, among others the Communist Manifesto and the Articles on India of the 1850s, that justifies the victories of the bourgeoisie in the past by the laws of history, the need to develop the productive forces, or the unripe character of the conditions for social emancipation. The relation between today and yesterday is not a unilateral one. In an eminently dialectical process, the present illumines the past, and the illumined past becomes a force in the present. Old battles are turned toward the rising sun, but they fuel the class consciousness of those who are rising up today, once they are touched by its rays. The sun here is not, as in the tradition of the progressive left, the symbol of the necessary, inevitable, and natural advent of a new world, but a symbol of the struggle itself and the utopian vision it inspires. Thesis 5. The true image of the past flits by. The past can be seized only as an image which flashes up the moment of its recognizability and, it ne and is never seen again. The truth will not run away from us. This statement by Gottfried Keller indicates exactly that point in historicism's image of history where the image is pierced by historical materialism. For it is an irretrievable image of the past which threatens to disappear in any present that does not recognize itself as intended in that image. A first version of Thesis 5 can already be found. Did I say Thesis 5? That was Thesis 5, anyway. A first version of Thesis 5 can already be found in the 1936 essay on Fuchs against the contemplative attitude of the traditional historian. Benjamin stresses the active engagement of the historical materialist. His objective is to discover the critical constellation formed by a particular fragment of the past with a particular moment of the present. The political and active dimension of this relation to the past is made explicit in one of the paralipomena to the theses. This concept of the present creates a connection between the writing of history and politics that is identical to the theological connection between remembrance and redemption. This present is expressed in images that may be called dialectical. They represent a salutary intervention of humanity. We find here again the paradoxical idea though one that is essential to Benjamin's intellectual approach of a sort of identity between certain theological concepts and their secular revolutionary equivalents. Moreover, one should not lose sight of the fact that the salutary intervention is aimed as much at the past as at the present. History and politics, remembrance and redemption are inseparable. The concept of dialectics is borrowed here by Benjamin from Hegelo Marxist phraseology. He is attempting to account for the nature of a salutary image that seeks to achieve the sublation, afabang, of the contradictions between past and present 
theory and practice. An example which does not come from Benjamin may enable us to cast light on Thesis 5. The dialectical image of permanent revolution formulated by Trotsky in 1905-06 to was based on the perception of a critical constellation between the Russian Revolution of 1905 and the Paris Commune of 1871. But this fleeting image that momentarily flitted by the historian political actor was lost. The Russian labor movement of the time did not recognize itself as implicated by the Paris Commune. Both the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, see Lenin's writings of 1905, explicitly rejected the reference to the Commune, which was criticized for having confused the democratic with the proletarian revolution. The joyous message the historian militant brought breathless from the past fell on deaf ears. It would be a dozen more years before, with Lenin's April Theses, which draw inspiration from the model of the Commune of 1871, a new constellation could emerge, this time successfully. An illuminating comment by Jeanne-Marie Gongbei on Benjamin's open history applies very exactly to Thesis 5. She writes that Benjamin shared with Proust the concern to rescue the past and the present, thanks to the perception of a resemblance that transforms them both. It transforms the past because the past takes on a new form, which could have disappeared into oblivion. It transforms the present because the present reveals itself as being the possible fulfillment of that earlier promise, a promise which could have been lost for all time, which can still be lost if it is not discovered and inscribed in the lineaments of the present. Krista Grefrath observes that this thesis in fact signifies the most radical historicization of historical truth. The true image of the past is itself subject to the historical process. So long as history does not come to a stop, the last word on the past cannot be pronounced. This interpretation is interesting, but too restrictive. It limits Retung to the historiographical domain and forgets and forgets that of political intervention. Now, as we have seen, for Benjamin, the two are strictly inseparable. One objection to this political conception of the past deserves to be examined here. Does this not run the risk of leading to an Orwellian rewriting of the past in terms of the present political needs of a totalitarian apparatus or state? As has already been abundantly demonstrated by Stalinist practice in the late 1930s in the USSR. Benjamin's argument is, however, radically distinct from, the, from that totalitarian model in several respects. One, there is, never in Benjamin's, in, there is never in Benjamin a claim to a monopoly of historical truth, and even less to impose such a truth on the whole of society. Two, whereas the Stalinist apparatus claim to possess a changeless final truth, fixed once and for all, denying any past or future change. Benjamin speaks of a fleeting, fragile image that flits by. <clears throat> I think I have hiccups. Three, there is no place in Benjamin for a state or state apparatus exerting ideological hegemony. The historian is an individual who always runs the risk of not being understood by his times. Thesis 6. Articulating the past historically does not mean recognizing it the way it really was. It means appropriating a memory as it flashes up in a moment of danger. Historical materialism wishes to hold fast that image of the past, which unexpectedly appears to the historical subject in a moment of, of danger. The danger threatens both the content of the tradition and those who inherit it. For both, it is one and the same thing, the danger of becoming a tool of the ruling classes. Every age must strive anew to wrest tradition away from the, con the conformism that is working to overpower it. The Messiah comes not only as the Redeemer, he comes as the victor over the Antichrist. The only historian capable of fanning the spark of hope in the past is the one who is firmly convinced 
that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he is victorious. And this enemy has never ceased to be victorious. The thesis begins by rejecting the historicist, positivist conception of history, represented by the famous phrase of Ranke. The conformist and conservative Prussian historian, which sees the task of the historian as being, quite simply, to represent the past the way it really was. The alleged neutral historian who has access directly to the real facts in reality only reinforces the view of the victors, the kings, popes, and emperors, the preferred object of Renke's historiography of all ages. The moment of danger for the historical subject, that is to say the oppressed classes, and the historian who has chosen their side, is the moment when the authentic image of the past emerges. Why? Probably because in that, dis in that instant, the comfortable, lazy vision of history as uninterrupted progress dissolves. The danger of a current defeat sharpens the sensitivity to preceding ones, arouses interest in the battle fought by the defeated, and encourages a critical view of history. Benjamin is thinking perhaps of his own situation too. Was it not the imminent danger in which he found himself in 1939-40? to 40? Arrest, internment, being handed over to the Gestapo by the Vichy authorities that give rise to the singular, if not indeed unique view of the past that emerges from the theses on the concept of history? In the moment, in the moment of danger, when the dialectical image flashes up or flits by, the historian or revolutionary has to show presence of mind to grasp this unique moment, this fleeting and precarious opportunity of salvation before it is too late. Because this memory may, as Benjamin's French version of this thesis underscores, be precisely what saves him. The danger is twofold, of transforming both the history of the past, the tradition of the oppressed, and the current historical subject the dominated classes, new heirs to that tradition, into tools in the hands of the ruling classes. To wrest the tradition away from the conformism that is working to overpower it is to restore to history, for example, the history of the French revolutions of 1789 or 1848, its dimension of subversion of the established order, which is toned down, obliterated, or denied by the official historians. It is only in this way that the historical materialist can fan the spark of hope in the past, a spark which can ignite the power or the powder keg today. The revolutionary historian knows the victory of the present enemy threatens even the dead, not necessarily in the crude, primitive form of the Stuart restoration, when Cromwell's remains were abused, but by the falsification or forgetting of their struggles. Now this enemy has never ceased to be victorious. From the point of view of the oppressed, the past is not a gradual accumulation of conquests, as in progressive historiography, but an interminable series of catastrophic defeats, the crushing of the slave rebellion against Rome, of the revolt of the Anabaptist peasants of the 16th century, of June 1848, of the Paris Commune, and the Spartacus Rising of 1919 in Berlin. But it is not just a question of the past. In his French translation, Benjamin writes, À l'heure qu'il est, l'ennemi n'a pas encore fini de triomph triompher. Oh, English translation. At the present time, the enemy is still continuing to triumph. And in 1940, the time was midnight in the century. To borrow once again Serge's fine expression, the enemy's victories were monumental. The defeat of Republican Spain, the Nazi-Soviet pact, the occupation of Europe by the Third Reich. Benjamin knew well this present enemy, fascism. For the oppressed, it represents the supreme danger, the greatest danger they have ever encountered in history. The second death of the victims of the past and the massacre of all the enemies of the regime. The falsification of the past on an unprecedented scale and the transformation of the popular masses into a tool of the ruling classes. Of course, in spite of, in spite of his vocation as a Cassandra and his radical pessimism, Benjamin could not predict Auschwitz. 
in the text of the lecture on Baudelaire delivered at Pontigny, Pontigny in May 1939, Benjamin observed that the crowds are today molded by the hands of the dictators. But he does not despair of glimpsing in these enslaved crowds cores of resistance, cores formed by the revolutionary masses of 1848 and the communards. In other words, in a moment of supreme danger, a saving constellation presents itself, linking the present to the past, a past in which, in spite of everything, in the dark night of fascism, there shines the star of hope, the messianic star of redemption. Franz Rosenzweig's Stern der Erlösung, the spark of the revolutionary uprising. Now, writes Benjamin, the Messiah comes not only as the Redeemer, he comes as the victor over the Antichrist. Commenting on this passage, Tiedemann notes a startling paradox. Nowhere else does Benjen Benjamin speak so directly theologically as he does here, yet nowhere does he have such a materialist intention. We have to see the Messiah as the proletarian class and the Antichrist as the ruling class. The observation is apt, but we might, for more precision, add that the secular equivalent, the correspondent of the Messiah today, are the core groups of anti-fascist resistance, the future revolutionary masses who are heirs to the tradition of June 1848 and April to May of 1871. As for the Antichrist, a Christian theologian, which Benjamin does not hesitate to incorporate into his explicitly Jewish-inspired messianic argument, his secular counterpart is undoubtedly Hitler's Third Reich. In a 1938 review of a novel by Anna Segers entitled Die Rettung, which tells the story of one of the communist resistance cells in Nazi Germany, Benjamin writes that the Third Reich mimics socialism the way the coming of the Antichrist mimics the blessing promised by the coming of the Messiah. For this striking parallel, Benjamin took his inspiration from the writings of his friend, the Swiss Protestant theological and revolutionary socialist, Fritz Lieb, who as early as 1934 had defined Nazism as the modern Antichrist. In a lecture of 1938, Lieb had expressed his hope of seeing the Antichrist defeated in the last battle against the Jews that would bring the appearance of the Messiah the Christ, and the establishment of his millennial kingdom. Thesis 7 Consider the darkness and the great cold in this veil resounding with misery. This was a quote from Bertolt Brecht um, from the Three Penny Opera. Addressing himself to the historian who wishes to relive an era, Fustel du de Coulange recommends that he blot out everything he knows about the later course of history. There's no better way of characterizing the method which historical materialism has broken with. It is a process of empathy. Its origin is indolence of the heart, that Achidia which despairs of appropriating the genuine historical image as it briefly flashes up among medieval theologians. Achidia was regarded as the root cause of sadness. Flaubert, who was fami familiar with it, wrote, Peu de gens devineront combien il a fallu être triste pour ressusciter Carthage. The nature of this sadness becomes clearer if we ask, with whom does historicism actually sympathize? The answer is inevitable, with the victor and all rulers are the heirs of prior conquerors. Hence, empathizing with the victor invariably benefits the current rulers. The historical materialist knows what this means. Whoever has emerged victorious participates to this day in the triumphal procession in which current rulers step over those who are lying prostrate. According to traditional practice, the spoils are carried in the procession. They are called cultural treasures, and historical materialist views them with cautious detachment. For in every case, these treasures have a lineage which he cannot contemplate without horror. They owe their existence not only to the efforts of the great geniuses who created them,
but also to the anonymous toil of others who lived in the same period. There is no document of culture which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. And just as such a document is never free of barbarism, so barbarism taints the manner in which it was transmitted from one hand to another. The historical materialist therefore dissociates himself from this process of transmission as far as possible. He, reg he regards it as his task to brush history against the grain. The polemic against Fussel de Coulange, the reactionary 19th century French positivist historian, continues and extends that of the earlier theses against Renke and German historicism. The past can be understood only in the light of the present. Its true image is fleeting and precarious. It flits by. But Benjamin introduces a new concept here, that of Einfühlung, the closest equivalent to which is empathy, but which he himself translates into French, not as empathie, but as identification affective. He accuses historicism of identifying with the victor. Self-evidently, the term victor does not refer here to common battles or wars, but to the class war, in which one of the sides, the ruling class, has constantly won out over the oppressed. From Spartacus the rebellious gladiator to Rosa Luxemburg's Spartacus Bund, and from the Roman Imperium to Hitler's Tertium Imperium on Third Reich, or third rank, sorry. The origin of the empathy that identifies with the triumphal procession of the dominators is to be found, according to Benjamin, in Achidia, a Latin term which denotes indolence of the heart, melancholia. Why? What is the relationship between Achidia and Einfalung? Thesis 7 does not explain this in any way but we can find the key to the problem in the origin of German tragic drama. Achidia is the melancholy sense of the omnipotence of fate, which removes all value from human activities. It leads, consequently, to total submission to the existing order of things. As profound melancholy meditation, it feels attracted, to it feels attracted by the solemn majesty of the triumphal procession of the powerful. The melancholic par excellence dominated by indolence of the heart, Achidia is the courtier. Betrayal is his element because his submission to destiny always makes him join the victor's camp. The modern equivalent of the Baroque courtier is the conformist historian. He too always chooses objective identification with the majestic triumphal procession of the powerful. The great historian Heinrich, Heinrich von Sibyl a disciple of Ranke was not at all reluctant to proclaim that success is the supreme judge and direct deciding factor in the eyes of the historian. This attitude was not just the prerogative of German historiography. Benjamin here cites Fustel de Coulange. He might also have mentioned Victor Cousin, who, in his introduction to the history of philosophy of 1828, develops an impressive philosophy of the victors which with admirable elegance links success with morality. It reads, I pardon victory as necessary and useful. I shall undertake now to pardon it as just, in the narrowest sense of the word. I shall undertake to demonstrate the morality of success. Ordinarily, success is seen merely as the triumph of force and a kind of sentimental sympathy attracts us to the defeated party. I hope that I have demonstrated that, since there always has to be a defeated party and the victor is always the party who has to win, it must be proved that the victor not only serves civilization, but, they, but that he is better and more moral, and it is for that reason he is the victor. If it were not thus, there would be a contradiction between morality and civilization, which is impossible, the two being merely two sides two distinct but harmonious elements of the same idea. It is against precisely this servile historicism that Benjamin is rebelling when he proposes to brush history against the grain. Without doubt, he takes his inspiration here from the early Nietzsche, the author of the second of the untimely observations on the advantage and disadvantage of history for life, a work read, admired, and quoted, including in the theses by Benjamin. 
Nietzsche had nothing but scorn for the historians swimming and drowned in the flow of becoming, who practiced naked admiration for success and the idolatry of the factual. In short, for the historian who always nods his yes, me mechanically, like a Chinese to any power. In his eyes, the devil is the true master of success and progress. Virtue, for the historian, consists in swimming against the historical waves and knowing how to struggle against them. Benjamin entirely shared these sentiments and drew on them in his refusal to imitate those who brush le poil trop luisant, the overglossy coat of history, an ironic expression Benjamin uses in his French translation of Thesis 7, the right way about. The decisive difference between the two is that Nietzsche's critique is made in the name of the rebellious individual, the hero, and leader the overman. That of Benjamin, by contrast, is in solidarity with those who have fallen beneath the wheels of those majestic, magnificent chariots called civilization, progress, and modernity. Brushing history against the grain, a formula of tremendous historiograph historiographical and political significance, means then, first of all, the refusal in one way or another to join the triumphal procession, which continues, even today, to ride roughshod over the bodies of those who prostrate. One thinks of those Baroque allegories of triumph that depict princes riding on a significant imperial chariot, sometimes with prisoners and chests overflowing with gold and jewels in train, or of that other image which Marx uses to describe capital, of Juggernaut, the Hindu divinity, seated on an immense chariot, beneath whose wheels are hurled the children that are to be sacrificed. But the old model that remains in the mind of all Jews is the Ark of Titus in Rome, which represents the triumphal procession of the Roman victors against the Jewish revolt, bearing the treasures looted from the Temple of Jerusalem. As ever in Benjamin, the imperative of brushing history against the grain has a dual meaning. One historical. This means going against the grain of the official version of history, setting the tradition of the oppressed against that version. From this point of view, the historical continuity of the ruling classes can be seen as an enormous single triumphal procession, occasionally interrupted by uprisings on the part of the subordinate classes. Two, political and current. Redemption, revolution will not occur in the mere natural course of things by dint of the meaning of history or inevitable progress. One has to struggle against the tide left to itself or brushed with the grain, so to speak, history will produce only new wars, fresh catastrophes, novel forms of barbarism and oppression. We are back here with the revolutionary pessimism of Benjamin, who called in his article on surrealism for the urgent organization of pessimism, which is equally as opposed to the melancholy fatalism of indolence of the heart as it is to the optimistic fatalism of the official social democratic or communist left, confident in the inevitable victory of the progressive forces. Benjamin's thinking also roves over the barbaric reverse side of the brilliant gilded medal of, of culture, that booty which passes from one victor to another like the seven-branched candelabra. The Jerusalem temple menorah in the same haute relief on the arch of Titus Instead of contrasting culture or civilization and barbarism as two mutually exclusive poles or as different stages of historical evolution, two classic leitmotifs of Enlightenment philosophy, Benjamin presents them dialectically as a contradictory unit or unity. Triumphal arches are a notable example of monuments of culture that are at the same time in, in, indissociably monuments of barbarism celebrating war and massacre. Benjamin's interest in this kind of architecture, its origins in ancient Rome, its political and ideological function, is attested by the Arcades project. In Berlin childhood, in Berlin childhood, we find a terrifying description of the Sigesol, the victory column, which stresses the contrast between the grace of the state of the Statue of Victory 
that sits atop the monument and the dark frescoes of its lower part, representing, in the child's imagination, scenes in which multitudes, lashed by whirlwinds encased in bloody tree stumps or sealed in blocks of ice, suffer like the damned of Dante's Inferno, as drawn by Gustave Doré. There's a striking parallel between this description and Brecht's poem that provides the epigraph to Thesis 7. The dialectic between culture and barbarism applies also to many other prestigious works produced by the anonymous toil of the oppressed, from the pyramids of Egypt built by Hebrew slaves to the Palais de l'Opera erected under Napoleon III by the defeated workers of June 1848. In this thesis, we find the inverted image of a theme dear to Nietzsche, the great works of art and civilization. The pyramids being a prime example can be produced only by subjecting the multitudes to suffering and enslavement. For the philosopher of Sils Maria, this was an inevitable necessary sacrifice. Writing this text, Benjamin no doubt had in mind Brett's ironic, irreverent poem of 1935, Questions from a worker who reads, Who built Thebes of the Seven Gates? In the books, you will find the names of kings. Did the kings haul up the lumps of rock? And Babylon many times demolished. Who raised it up so many times? Great Rome is full of triumphal arches. Who erected them? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? Every page of victory who cooked the feast for the victors. Every ten years a great man who paid the bill. So many reports, so many questions. But Thesis 7 has a more general significance. High culture could not exist in its historical form without the anonymous labor of the direct producers, slaves, peasants, or workers, themselves excluded from the enjoyment of cultural goods. These latter are, therefore, documents of barbarism insofar as they are the products of class injustice, social and political oppression, and inequality, and because they are handed down by way of wars and massacres. The cultural heritage passed from Greece to Rome and thence to the church. From there it has fallen into the hands of the bourgeoisie, where it has remained from the Renaissance to our own day. In each case, the ruling elite appropriates the preceding culture, either by conquest or other barbaric means, and integrates it into the system of social and ideological domination. Culture and tradition thus become, as Benjamin emphasizes in his thesis, thesis 6, a total of the ruling classes. To brush cultural history, gegen den Strick means then to view it from the standpoint of the defeated, the excluded, the pariahs. For example, the rich culture of the, of the French Second Empire must be examined, as Benjamin does in the Arcades Project by taking account of the defeat of the workers in June 1848 and the repression of the revolutionary movement, Blanky, over several decades to which that defeat led. Similarly, the glittering culture of Weimar must be seen in relation to the situation of the unemployed, the poor, and the victims of inflation, as in One Way Street. In other words, to quote one of the preparatory notes for the theses, The History of Culture, has to be integrated into the history of the class struggle. This does not mean that Benjamin advocated cultural populism. Far from rejecting the works of high culture as reactionary, he was of the opinion that many of them were overtly or covertly hostile to capitalist society. The point was then to recover the utopian or subversive moments hidden in the cultural heritage, whether it be in the fantastic tales of Hoffman, Baudelaire's poems, or Leskov's stories. According to Richard Wollen, Benjamin in his last essays and in the theses no longer speaks of the offbung of traditional bourgeois culture, an idea he entertained in the work of art essay and his commentaries on Brecht. Rather, it is the effort to preserve and render exotic the secret utopian potential embedded in traditional works of culture that Benjamin views as the preeminent task of materialist criticism. This is true inasmuch as this preservation is dialectically linked to the destructive moment. It is only by breaking through the reified utter husk of official culture that the oppressed can take possession of this critical utopian kernel. 
Benjamin is concerned to safeguard the subversive, anti-bourgeois forms of culture by seeking to prevent their being embalmed, neutralized, lauded, and academicized by the cultural establishment. There is a fight to be had to prevent the ruling class from extinguishing the flames of past culture and to preserve that culture from the conformism that threatens it. Threatens it. We may illustrate the significance of the demand that history be brushed against the grain with a recent Latin American example. The celebration of the um, Cinquecentennial cinque 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 of the Discovery of the Americas. The cultural festivities organized by the state, the church, or by private initiative are fine examples of empathy with the victors of the 16th century. And Eiffelung, Eif Eifel which unfailingly redounds to the advantage of today's leaders, the local and multinational financial elites that have inherited the power of the old conquistadors. To write history a contrasson, the term Benjamin uses in his own French translation of the theses is to refuse any effective identification with the official heroes of the Cinque Centennial, the Iberian colonialists, and the European powers who brought religion, culture, and civilization to the savage Indians. This means, savage is in quotation marks, by the way. This means regarding every monument of colonial culture, the cathedrals of Mexico City or Lima, Cortez's palace at Cuernavaca as being also a document of barbarism, a product of war, extermination, and ruthless oppression. For centuries, the official history of the discovery, conquest, and conversion of South America was not merely hegemonic, but practically the only version on the political and cultural scene. It was not until the Mexican Revolution of 1911 that this hegemony began to be contested. Diego Rivera's frescoes at Cortez's palace in Cuernavaca mark a genuine turning point in the history of Latin American culture by their iconoclastic demystification of the conquistador and the artist's sympathy for the native warriors. Fifty years later, Open Veins of Latin America, the famous work by one of the continent's greatest essayists, the Uruguayan Eduardo Galignano presents in a powerful synthesis the charge sheet of Iberian colonization from the point of view of the victims and their cultures, the Indians, the black slaves, and the mestizos. During the debate on the Cinque Centennial, Galliano intervened in almost Benjaminian terms. I do not know if he has ever read the 1940 theses to call for the celebration of the defeated. not the victors and the safeguarding of some of our oldest traditions such as the communal way of life because it is from its most ancient sources that america can draw to find its freshest lifeblood the past says things that concern the future while spain europe and the usa were preparing to celebrate the coming of christopher columbus a latin american meeting held at zela ju guatemala one of the bastions of Maya culture, in October 1991, called for the commemoration of five centuries of Black, Indian, and popular resistance. The Zapatistas of the EZLN initially wanted their uprising to coincide with the anniversary of 1492, but for reasons of military unreadiness, put off their action until 1994. They were, however, behind an act of symbolic reparation the overturning of the statue of the conquistador Diego de Mazariega in the center of San Cristobal de los Casas, the capital of the Chiapas, in 1992 by a crowd of indigenous peoples that had come down from the mountains. Politics, culture, and history were intimately interlinked in the clashes around the, the Cinque Centennial but that would hardly have surprised Walter Benjamin.